the lights come on on stage. Somebody walks onto an empty stage and says, what a beautiful day it is in Verona. And the whole audience goes, we're in Verona. They're there to, to willingly suspend their belief. They want to believe. Hello, I'm Patrick Pacheco. Welcome to this episode of Theater, All the Moving Parts. My guest is Harvey Firestein, the prized and prolific writer of such Broadway hits as Torch Song Trilogy, La Cage Au Folle, Kinky Boots, and Newsies. Now he's written a raw and revealing memoir, I Was Better Last Night. Most critics agree that the book couldn't possibly be better. Welcome, Harvey, to theater, all the moving parts. Yeah, that's how you know where you are. <laughs> I, right. I like that, because you know. I very often wake up and I'm not really sure. <laughs> we're, we're partners in that respect. <laughs> Congratulations on all the moving parts of your blazingly honest and very, very funny memoir. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That, well, you have to congratulate, actually, you have to congratulate COVID. Oh, okay. Because were it not for COVID, I would not have had all that typing time. Well, it was good use, very good use of time. Uh, speaking of moving parts, you made Stephen Sondheim cry. Why not? Look like <laughs> what he does to other people. He was very moved by you is when you sang Rose's turn at a benefit, I think. Well, what happened is, you know, Stephen turned 50. There was a benefit, 51 benefit, <laughs> two benefit. He started benefit. So there was a dreamy <laughs> concert coming up, and the fight always was, who of the many divas is going to get to sing Rose's turn? Uh -huh. So they decided this year... And to, to avoid that fight, I would sing Rose's Turn. I was doing Fiddler on the Roof at the time. Kevin Stites, who was the musical director, came up with this idea. Come out dressed as Tevya, uh -huh. and I'll give you the, the rich man vamp. Doom -da -da -doom -da, doom -da -da -doom -da. So I walked out, you know, world weary, Tevya with the beard and the yarmulke, the whole thing. Doom -da -da -doom -da, doom -da -da -doom -da. Why did I do it? <laughs> Why did it get me? By the end of that song, you'd reduced him to tears, and I'm probably not, it's other people in the audience as well. Why well, do you suppose that was? We did it, I did it very straight. I didn't camp it up at all. I did it, you know, I mean, really asking why. I mean, I, I was playing Rose. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, it only started with that vamp. You know, I laughed my head off. Right. But why am I crying? Right, exactly. It was, very, it was a very sweet note. Carol Channing, when she saw Tor Song Trilogy, of course, which put you in the map, said, it is the gay raisin in the sun. That is not what she said. She said, Harvey, <laughs> this is the gay <laughs> raisin in the sun. <laughs> I stand well, I, corrected. <laughs> What's amazing is that you started, obviously, and Torsong Tril Trilogy started in the East Village, in, you know, around the underground, the off-off Broadway. What is it that you learned in those years, Harvey, about captivating an audience that continues to this day? Yeah, it's hard because, you know, most people that you know and most people I know in theater, they like saw somebody on stage and said, I want to do that with my life. That was not me. I never wanted to be an actor, never wanted to be a writer, never planned on it. I wanted to be an artist. I knew I wasn't a very good artist, but I had enough training to know there were always jobs. I could pull somebody's silk screens. I could develop somebody's film for them. So when I came to the East Village, that was the scene. The scene, of course, had a lot of theater, but theater was also, we were making masks. We were you know, doing all kinds of stuff. I was with the Playhouse of the Ridiculous, the Theater of the Ridiculous, uh, uh, Theater of Lost Continent, um, uh, Theater yeah, Genesis, sure. all those companies. All those gallery players. So when I started writing, um, I was I was imitating everybody else, right. which is what I guess you do when you when you start out, right. um, and not getting anywhere. Um, and then I, I hit on something where I realized it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That theater has to be a conversation between the audience and it's live. It's right. not a movie. It's not TV. It's not even a painting. The conversation has to be real. You cannot tell the audience what to think. You have to present your case, much like a jury. Present your case, not even as as hard as as you would to a jury, and allow them to to make up their minds. Um, the hardest part was, and what a lot of bad writers don't understand. What a lot of bad writers what don't understand writers, is you have to have more than one opinion. <laughs> it, right. I mean. A lot of bad writers want to write a scene about something, and you watch the scene and you say the other characters don't have an opinion. There's no right, right. and wrong. Right. There's only right. This is what I believe, and that's it. And the audience isn't there to see your opinion. Right. They're there to be in conversation with the. But ideas. at some point in the evolution of your playwriting, you must have realized this is what the audience can take in a way, and I'm, what I'm talking about is that you have a genius for being able to gauge an audience's willing suspension of disbelief. How did you learn that? Mm, I, uh, um, I think that's just my act of faith. To me, the theater is a church. I, I, I don't mm-hmm. believe in God and all that. So the theater is my church. And uh, a, a bunch of strangers come in that would never sit near, near each other in normal life. You know, it's not a restaurant where you have separate tables. You're sitting right next to each other. And you're all coming in together. And you're all going to sit there. And you have this experience together. It's the lights come on on stage. Somebody walks onto an empty stage and says, what a beautiful day it is in Verona. And the whole audience goes, we're in Verona. They're there to to willingly suspend their belief. They want to believe. They've come to believe. They've come to have this experience, and we just have to feed it to them. If we don't, then we cheat them. And you know it on some intuitive intuitive level. Is it intuitive? I don't know. Uh, my big break, my big breakthrough yeah. was I can't really tell it on the television. It's in the book, but something happened sexually. I wrote about it, thinking I was writing this great tragic monologue. Yes, exactly. Um, early in the morning, I read it to Sherry Burke. Yes. Um, who was another actress at La Mama. And I read it to her like at 8 o'clock in the morning. And, sh- and I'm sitting there reading this to her, holding back tears. And she's laughing her ass off. Right. And I'm saying, okay, maybe I'm reading it wrong. But I just kept reading it. And when I finished, she said, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. Right. And I stood back and I said, I've just found the banana peel. That is, of course, the beginning of Tor Song Trilogy when you are in a, back room, in a back room getting, uh, yeah, getting, getting pleasure. Getting pleasure. Without, getting, ple- without get- pleasure. But that idea of human tragedy is so close to human comedy. Yeah. And what is it? It's what's common is the human. So when the audience knows exactly what you're saying, they laugh or cry. Right. And, and does the audience continue to surprise you to this day? With their reactions, can you? Yeah, and sometimes they, you just know you're wrong, and right. you don't know why you're wrong. You know, Jerry Mitchell and I were laughing last night. I went to the preview of, of Kinky Boots, and there's a scene in Kinky Boots that I thought was so cl- Oh, I was so clever to write it. Um, <laughs> Charlie, uh, the factory guy, has to fire everybody in the factory. And I said, what a boring thing that's going to be to just have people yes. come in. Uh-huh. So I said, while he's firing them up on this platform here, down on stage, we'll have the drag queens perform a number. Right. And it'll comment on it, kind of like it'll be our own cabaret. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be as good as this Fosse. <laughs> oh, I'm so smart. And so <laughs> I came up with this idea that while he's firing upstairs, they're doing a magic act. And Lola is, you know, this is where they have those boxes and you put the knives in, uh-huh. the swords in. Uh-huh. And so Lola's sticking a knife in. Every time he fires somebody, he sticks a knife in. Oh, it was fabulous. It was fabulous. <laughs> Died. <laughs> so he said, okay, it's the knives. It's the knives. It's too violent. Too violent. Let's do it. A disappearing box instead. Uh-huh. Died. Mm-hmm. We weren't telling the story. Yeah. The story was he's firing people. So it, what we did down on the stage was just kept doing the same number they had been singing since the old day of the show, <laughs> with a little variation. So it, it entertained but didn't take away from the story we were telling upstairs. When you went from the underground, from La Mama, from Ellen Stewart and Ron 
Tavel. Ron Tavel. Ron Tavel. And went mainstream, at least to Broadway success. By the time you were 31, you'd won two Tony Awards. Did you find that you had to make a concerted effort to maintain the renegade spirit that you had had off, off, off Broadway? No, because that's always been me. That's it's always, just you. That's just me, and that's who, and that's still who I am, and that's still, this, this idea of commercial success is a fun thing to play with. So I just do what seems right. If somebody thinks it's commercial and puts money in, that's a lovely thing. I would love it because our idea is to reach audiences. And the littler theaters sort of disappeared. Ellen Stewart really wasn't interested in doing the spoken word much more. Um, once, when, in my heyday, mm -hmm. she was already switching over to um, global theater. Mm -hmm. What's the smartest thing Ellen Stewart ever taught you? Oh, so many things, but... Uh, I guess, I guess when she said, um, say no to everything. Uh, I did the opposite. Yes, I you said yes life, to everything. I made my life the opposite. But I thought it was real. I thought it, the point was, if you say no, then think about that, you know, because you have to think mm -hmm. about it. Right. And then you think about it and you go back and, and you say yes, oh, you're, you're a hero. Right. But if you say no and it stays no, then you've already broken their hearts. It's okay. <laughs> but you always say yes. But, but uh, yeah. Despite I'm, Shirley MacLaine's warning you, you said yes to Arthur Lawrence, <laughs> right? I'd already said yes before, but yeah. And, and lots of people uh, would have warned you. Uh, yes. I think Mary Rogers says, talent excuses everything except Arthur Lawrence. Well, you know my line about Arthur. Which, uh, tell us, please. Uh, well, it was his 80th birthday, I think, and the Times called me and said, it's his birthday, what do you want to say? I said, Arthur Lawrence is living proof that the good die young. <laughs> Because he lived well into, and he didn't speak to me for at least two years <laughs> after that. <laughs> but he, what did you, what did you learn from uh, your experience with Jerry Herman, obviously, and Arthur uh, on Lacage? Well, Jerry, Jerry, and I just had this wonderful marriage. You know, we we consider ourselves the parents of Lacage uh, until his death, and I miss him all the time. Yeah, it's not like Arthur. It was a loving relationship. We never fought. If he ever had anything negative to say. He gave it to Arthur to say, and, and, and the same with me. But I didn't like a lyric. I'd say, Arthur. Um, so Jerry and I never fought. But Arthur was just different. Arthur was mean. Yeah. Arthur was truthful. Yeah. Arthur was bitter. Um, whatever it was he wanted from life, he couldn't get. And I don't I never figured out because he had it all. Yeah. Um, he had people that worshipped him. Yeah. Um, were it not for Tom, his his partner, who he didn't always credit as his partner, uh, Tom kept him from yeah. killing me. Yeah. Because he, because <laughs> he would have killed me. You just mentioned that Arthur had a lot. I mean, a tremendous amount of success, a tremendous amount of commercial commercial success, Absolutely. a lot of money, a lot of people that admired him, and yet there there he was. You had a tremendous amount of success. You had a tremendous amount of people that loved you, loved your work. Half a bottle of scotch a night at one point? No. Suicide? Half a bottle? Half, half a bottle of nothing. A half a gallon <laughs> oh, wow. of 100 proof okay. southern comfort yeah. a day. Why? Numb. Numb. Just checked out numb. Didn't feel anything, didn't want to feel anything, didn't want to think, didn't want to, and nobody knew I drank. I right. did it all secretly. Right. Bottles were, I lived alone and I hid the bottles. <laughs> was it that you were lonely, Harry? Was it fear of fame? No, I had, I had lovers all through that time. Do you get reach a certain it, plateau of success? Six Tony no, Awards, four Tony Awards. It's not. Fear of failure? No, Figure into it? No, it was AIDS. Yeah. Having lived through the AIDS crisis, having lost so many people. I mean, you, when you lay in bed with your eighth or ninth person and tell them to, it's okay to die. Yeah. It's somebody you love while the doctors and nurses are standing outside a closed door with a mask and all that. And, you know, and they won't even go near you when you come out because they're going to get sick. There's not a lot of life left in you when you've done that. All of these fights, all of these battles in the long run had just done me in. Part of the victories of the wars that you fought was that we were, as you put in the book, we were gays, now we're humans. That's what Tort Song did eventually. Lacage took that a little further. Uh, in Lacage, getting back to Arthur Lawrence, he called you a heterophobe. Were you a heterophobe? Yeah. I went to an, uh, an, an art school where most of the students were gay. We busted the heterosexuals, it was the law. But, um, <laughs> and 
then, then in, in theater, in community theater, the first gay people I knew had been together yeah. for 38 years. Yeah. So I didn't know till I got into the world how loathed we were for no reason, for absolutely no reason. Um, and it began to, when somebody tells you you're not human, you say, okay, stay over there. Yeah. Just stay over there. You walk on your side of the street, I walk on mine. So did that make me a heterophobe? It made me more apt to want to work with gay people. Right. I understood them, they understood me, I didn't have to explain myself. And if you read my stuff and you watch my plays, I don't explain. Yeah. You know, like Hajifo, I said to Arthur that very first day, I said, you have to understand, the gay people are the normal people. The straight people are the freaks coming in here. Right. They're right. the strange things. It, the gay world is the normal world here. And that was very hard for him to say. In the battlefield, in the, in the war with you, obviously was Larry Kramer. And at one point, Larry said, any gay playwright that's not writing about AIDS, you know, should go to hell, or in short. Did you have a problem with that in no. terms of Larry's uh, militancy, in terms of demanding that gay men write about AIDS? Yeah, I loved Larry so much. He was such an original spirit. How could you not? And he was doing things that nobody, did he make me crazy? Of course he did. There was a day, uh, we were doing the AIDS walk, so I'm introducing everybody, and one of the people is Edward the Great, Ed Koch. Oh, yeah. And up from the back of the crowd comes Larry <laughs> with a protest <laughs> sign, you know, and he's waving and he's waving, and I'm going like, oh, my God. <laughs> and, and he keeps moving closer and closer until he's maybe a foot and a half away from Ed, totally blocking him. And I finally stood up and said, Larry, he can see it. <laughs> He's seen it. He's, you know, but that was Larry. <laughs> you know, the, you, you also talk about, to some extent, the tensions within the gay community uh, and the fact that, as you said, nobody hates us like we hate ourselves. Do you think that's still true? There will always be people that hate themselves. And there'll always be people that don't want to be other. And there's always people that want to fold in. But there, there always will be that thing of us hating ourselves. I'm not smart enough to uh, have enough d degrees in psychology to understand self-loathing, but it's there in the straight community also, but it's very destructive in our community. You, just switching gears here, just because uh, in terms of hairspray. America. I made this myself. You said that plain Edna Turnblatt uh, made you love yourself more in, oh, yeah. than any other role that you'd ever played. Why right. is that? Well, first of all, I love acting um, other people's words or their, or their conception. You know, this was John Waters' right. conception and Divine had come up with the character right. and all that. And I love that because acting in your own work, you don't learn anything. I wrote it. Yeah. I know everything about it. Ugh. Give me a challenge. So I love playing Edna for that reason. Secondly, I was playing somebody who was a woman, not a drag queen, but it was a woman. I was a mother, which I adored. I had this family. I had Dick Latessa, who mm -hmm. there was no greater gift on this earth. You ask um, uh, any of the women who played opposite him in anything. Um, from you know, from follies uh, to yeah. guys and uh, everything, um, just incredible partner. And we got to perform like Fred and Ginger. Yeah. You know, this fantasy of I mean, if there ever is a Broadway fantasy, it's standing center stage on an empty stage, a partner singing a love song to each other, singing and dancing. Um, it was a uh, oh, it was magical. And you went it was from, magical every night. And when you and you went from Mama to Papa. You went to Tevya. And, and that and was the joke. How was it to play opposite Rosie O'Donnell as your gold? Oh, well, well, well you Rosie was my third. I'm sorry, was third it? Third wife. Oh, your third I wife. Went, I, I stayed so long, I went through four wives. <laughs> oh, I went through three wives. How was it to play with Rosie O'Donnell? She's not mentioned in the book much. Well, her, her picture's there because yeah. she didn't open it. I opened I see. it to somebody else. But, um, oh, I, I, but here's the thing about Rosie. Yes, I adored Rosie and she's so wonderful. And, and, this, and I put the moment in the book where we touched each other. I had this idea that men and women did not touch in those mm -hmm. days. They just did. So all during Do You Love Me, we never touched. At the very end of the show, after they've been thrown out, they're standing there and um, 
and they both put their hands on the wagon that they're going to take everything away in, and finally the two of them touch. Which is radical. Which is radical. So it brings I, you back to your radical. I loved it. In terms of kinky boots, you had written Lola as a heterosexual, <laughs> and I think Billy Porter, who isn't much in the book as well, had, had insisted that he was gay. That well, he, that's how he played it. Well, the entire second act opens with a big song, What a Woman Wants, right? about women being attracted to him and him being attracted to women. I said, it makes no sense. But he actually says in his book, I love Billy. Uh -huh. I adore Billy. You know, he's such an individual. Um, but he <laughs> says in his book that he got me to rewrite it. I didn't get me to rewrite it. He just didn't play it that way. But but other people have. And, and well, you felt in the book, you say that it wasn't until Wayne Brady played it. Well, Wayne that really played it. It was the full realization yeah. of the character. And still, a lot of people don't understand heterosexual transvestites. Right. I had just done all of that research for Casa Valentina. Because right. I was writing Newsies, Kinky Boots, and Casa Valentina at the same time. Wow. So I had stuff going on in my brain. Well, Kinky took so long because I was waiting, always waiting for my daughter, Cindy Lauper, on the road. Yes. You know, she was coming here, she was coming there. Cindy, give me a song. And she'd hum something into her recorder and send it to me. <laughs> um, and then I had the opposite end of that is is Alan Menken, who I actually made T-shirts that because uh, he said to me once, I said, oh, it's a shame we have to throw that melody out. And he said, forget it. I gorgeous melodies. <laughs> so I had that made into a t-shirt. It, it's wanted. amazing, isn't it? The, his facility it's is unbelievable. extraordinary. It's unbelievable. In all genres as in well. In all genres. In and all so, genres. So I had that. And then the third thing, of course, was writing Casa Valentina, where I was doing mm -hmm. all this research about heterosexual transvestites. Right. And they fascinated me. And I wasn't all that thrilled to just be writing just about another drag queen in this. I wanted, because those two men are the same. Mm -hmm. They're two men, Charlie and Lola, who grew up thinking they were disappointing their fathers. Mm -hmm. Their fathers wanted them to be, Charlie's father wanted him to go into the factory and make shoes. Uh, um, Lola's father wanted him to be a boxer. They both grew up not wanting anything their fathers wanted. Now their fathers were gone and they were living with that torture. And they meet and they heal each other. That's what the show's about. It's not about making shoes. It's not about anything else. It's about healing yourself to what your parents expected your life to be and finally accepting yourself for who you turned out to be. As, as a lion in winter, what do you think of the young cubs that are coming up? What did you think of Michael R. Jackson's A Strange Loop? I still haven't seen it. And I'll tell you why. I don't like seeing theater with, with a mascot. Is that terrible? And so I put off seeing um, everything now that we're mask, mm -hmm. what do you call it, it's your choice? Yeah. So now I'm buying tickets to see everything. Have you so read about it? Wait. Have you read oh, about how frank it is, how explicit it is? Oh, no, absolutely, is? yeah. And, and uh, do you have, have you formed any opinion just from reading? No, how can I, I need to see it. Or what but do you I'm, think? I'm, but am I thrilled it's there? Yeah. Oh yeah. And am I thrilled it's gotten all the, the, the awards and all that? Oh yeah. And was I, did my heart go out to them when I heard how long it took to, to write it? Oh, yeah. 40 years. But it's great that they put that work in. Um, or oh, 20 years, excuse 20 years. me. He else? started. Um, yeah, he's not even 40 years old. But <laughs> how, 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 you know, to talk about dedication. What else is on your plate? What's the next uh, thing? Um, we're, we're putting a new company into Funny Girl as we speak. There's a. There's a rehearsal going on up the block <laughs> uh, with, with Tova Felchu. Tell me a little bit about rewriting Funny Girl and the whole idea of gay uh, diva worship and how yeah. that branded uh, Funny Girl. And was that an obstacle you had to overcome and Beanie Feldstein had to overcome as well? I tried to do it in such a way that people who love Funny Girl would not know what I did. Unless you sat there with the movie or with the original script and went, oh, he got rid of that character. Oh, he moved that scene. Oh, he got rid of that song. Oh, he. But if you just sit and you watch Funny Girl, it's Funny Girl. It's Funny Girl. It looks like Funny Girl, sounds like Funny Girl. It's Funny Girl. Um, then when it goes into production, you are facing a show that was built around a personality. Right. But that's the Barbara problem. The Barbara problem. Hello, gorgeous. And, that's, and that I can't solve, um, a, a writer can't solve that. That's the choreographer, the director, the musical director and all that. That becomes their, their thing to work on. Um, and, and, and I have to say, Beanie gave it her all. Yeah. You know, whatever you're, you're gonna say, 
This is not a woman who walked into the room and said, I'm not gonna try. Right. You know, she tap danced her feet raw. And you know about trying. We have to wrap up, but just a final question about trying, uh, writing your, your book, your wonderful book. Did you like yourself more? Uh, you know, I'm still in a very strange place. It took so much more out of me than I ever thought it would. I have not been able to write um, anything that heavy since writing. Part of it is because I'm still doing interviews about it. But um, a, a part of it's because you need to refill the well. Yeah. You need to live again and you need to breathe. And some of that still comes back in dreams. Anyway, I'm writing another chapter for the book. Oh, good. And that, what, the what will the chapter be? On, on the reaction to the book. On the reaction to the book. Yeah, for the, okay. for the, for the, um, for the paperback, which comes out March 23rd. Why they know it comes out March 23rd, they're based. But, and I also had a wonderful editor. Let me tell you how I picked my editor. Peter Gethers is my editor. He edited the two big Sondheim volumes. Great. So, yeah. You know, who you gonna? Yeah. Who you gonna go? You couldn't get better. So we started with Stephen Sondheim, and we'll end and we'll end with Stephen, with Stephen Sondheim. Sondheim. And after we're done, I'll tell you that story you wanted to know. <laughs> okay, great. And I'll share it with you <laughs> later. <laughs> Harvey, congratulations it's to see you again. again. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more fascinating conversations with artists and thought leaders as New York theater, The Fabulous Invalid, regains its invaluable place in American culture. I'm Patrick Pacheco.